Hello all, I'm Dr. Jennifer Camden. I'm the Beverly J. Pitts Distinguished Professor of the Strain Honors College, a Professor and Associate Chair of the English Department. And I also coordinate our annual Community um, Book Club course and reading series. And I'm really um, delighted to have you all here tonight for our last um, lecture of the series. Uh, every year I um, invite colleagues both at University of Indianapolis and elsewhere to come give a talk from their own disciplinary perspective on a classic novel that's then paired um, with our book club course where we read it slowly over the course of the semester and discuss it online. Um, and so we were already set up to have the online discussions when the pandemic hit, um, but we've had to sort of pivot and, and reimagine the lecture series to a virtual lecture series. I'm, I'm very grateful for my colleagues who've been willing to transition to that format. I know we all miss gathering in person, but it's also been wonderful um, to see so many of you in the online lectures and then to be able to, as, as we've wanted to for a while, to be able to make those lectures available um, for, for later viewing. So the lecture tonight will be recorded. If you are not interested in being immortalized on the internet, you're welcome to turn off your cameras now. Um, and please also do mute yourself so that we don't end up with a lot of um, surprise audio. As soon as I'm done with this introduction, I will also be meeting myself so that my dog or my children don't make a guest appearance in the middle of Dr. Evans's lecture. Um, so if you just scroll down at the bottom, you'll see that little microphone icon and you can, can click on it to mute yourself. Or we will have time for a Q&A at the end. And so we'll hopefully have something resembling those wonderful in-person discussions that we would typically have. Um, so if this is your first Communiversity event, welcome. For the past five years, um, starting with a grant from Yvonne Shaheen and the Shaheen College of Arts and Sciences, we've been able to organize this kind of book club course that brings together UND students with members of the community and faculty and staff to read and discuss a book online. And um, one of the surprising upsides of the pandemic, or perhaps of choosing an Agatha Christie novel, is that this has been our um, most enrolled community with the most attended lectures ever. So it's been really exciting to get to meet so many more members of our community who are also excited about reading and, and talking about books. And I've, I've really enjoyed that, um, particularly in the times we're living through. Um, I'm excited to announce tonight our book for next year. Hopefully it will have you all running back to sign up and not scaring you off. Um, but we're gonna tackle a whale of a book. We're going to try Herman Melville's great American novel, Moby Dick. My hope is that this is a novel that you've always meant to read, um, but maybe were daunted by the, the sheer heft of, um, or maybe that you read a long time ago, but would really like to revisit in the company of fellow readers. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to reading that together next fall. For UND students, you can just register as you usually would. UND alumni, um, faculty and staff can contact Kathy Elliott in the registrar's office and everyone else I promise that we will have a link to register up in the usual place um, this summer the community website where you can also find the recordings of the lecture series from this year and um, the wonderful art by our art major Ashley Andre, who did a beautiful book plate and bookmark that you can print at home. So in a typical year, um, our wonderful colleagues at Hullabaloo, Hullabaloo Press would design these beautiful posters to promote our events. Um, it was one of the few perks I could offer our faculty speakers was a, a hand designed poster to, to commemorate their lecture. Um, but instead this year, we have a, a print at home book plate and bookmark that you uh, can have to commemorate your community experience. Um, it's a great design. It's always a treat to see what the students come up with. And, and this year's um, no exception to that rule. So you can also find that at our website. If you just Google UND Community, um, we will we'll pop right up. Um, so without further ado, I wanna to welcome tonight's lecturer, Jonathan Evans. Every time Dr. Evans speaks, I'm always wishing that we could team teach a course together. He always brings a new and interesting insight from his background as a professor of philosophy um, to literature. And it, it just always helps me to see the text in a new way. And, and so he's graciously been a participant since the very first community. And I'm, I'm always glad that he continues to say yes when I ask. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Evans. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, thank you, Jen, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, good evening and welcome, everyone. I appreciate your willingness to join us on a November evening. Uh, I have to admit that if you have not read the book, 
Uh, there will be some spoilers. I'll try to minimize those, but uh, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot to <laughs> to prevent that, especially uh, well given the topic, as we'll see shortly. However, the good news is that Agatha Christie is such a good writer that uh, even reading her a second or a third time when you already know a plot is still a very rewarding experience. So uh, as a philosopher, uh, there are a lot of things that I think are interesting in, in novels, particularly mystery novels. But I think there's one that especially emerges, and we'll see that tonight as we look at uh, uh, the mysterious affair at Styles. So when you think of the ingredients of a good mystery novel, I think one of those key ingredients is the initial absence of evidence, or maybe even the presence of misleading evidence about major points in the plot of the novel. I mean, after all, if the novel is a mystery novel, we expect that many of our pressing questions will remain unresolved. Well, at least not indefinitely, but at least long enough, right? Now, one device I think that authors often use uh, is to allow characters to make statements or to behave in ways that are deceiving uh, to both other characters and to the reader. But I think that leads to an important moral question. And so here's that question. Is it morally permissible to allow others to persist in believing something false? When you have the evidence that you could reveal to show the individual to discard the false belief that they have, and potentially, if not in fact, replacing that false belief with a true one. Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to put aside the issue of the author's responsibility to the reader, although that's a very interesting question. But one reason I want to put that aside is, I mean, when you and I, well, at least I'll speak for myself, I probably shouldn't speak for you, but when I read a mystery novel, I'm, on a, I'm fully aware that the author may intend to deceive me, but I judge that intention to be both benign and something honestly I consent to. Uh, it's an enjoyment, it's, it's part of the deal. So rather than looking at the author's responsibility to the reader, I'd like to examine the characters in the mystery novel because I think what that will do is shed some light on how we should act towards others in ordinary contexts. So you don't have to be in a mystery uh, to address this moral question we have. But I think when we're in the context of a mystery, it's especially interesting. So let's give a preliminary answer to this moral question uh, with one of our favorite characters, Hercule Poirot. When we look at the novel, The mystery, uh, Mysterious Affairs at Styles, it's not the mystery, Mr. Mysterious Affairs, excuse me. But uh, when we look at his actions and his words, it looks like his answer to this question is a definitive yes. Now, remember that question is, are we in a position and is it morally acceptable for us to not intervene in a situation where someone else has a false belief? Now, in the abstract, I think we could agree that they may, that might not seem to be troubling. I think there are many good reasons that allow people to believe fairly insignificant falsehoods. I mean, consider being in a conversation with your neighbor. You and your neighbor have decided you talk about politics, which might be a little dangerous, but you agree that you'll talk about politics in the 20th century or presidents who, who lived prior to your birth. So imagine uh, you're talking to your neighbor and your neighbor says, well, you know, back when, when Jimmy Carter was president in 1976 and immediately that bell rings in your head and you, and you think, well, he wasn't president in 76. The election was in 76. Well, I think we can all agree that to, to stop the conversation, just to point out that our neighbor has made an error in date, um, just so that we can ensure that they have a true belief rather than a false belief, seems to be uh, unnecessary and maybe, maybe even inappropriate. Um, and so there are a lot of cases like this where it just seems fairly straightforward, just let other people persist in their false beliefs. Morally, it's fine, and maybe sometimes morally, that's what we should do. However, I think there are some obvious limits, and this is what I wanna focus on, because it'll tie in nicely with a key case that occurs at the end of the novel. Suppose, a jury is about to convict an innocent defendant. And suppose you have evidence that would exonerate the defendant, yet you decide to withhold it. 
you decide to let the jury, the judge, anyone affected to the trial persist in a mistaken belief that the defendant in fact is guilty. Well, I think we would agree that in that case, someone does something wrong, at least other things being equal. So what that does, I think, is to pose two key questions. Uh, and the first question, one which we'll try to uh, get an answer to tonight is, well, what are the limits? And what I mean by that is, on the one hand, when is it not permissible to allow others to persist in believing something false? When you're able to provide evidence that would result in the person discarding that false belief, or even potentially, if not in fact, replace that false belief with a true one. And then of course, the other side is, when is it permissible for me to intervene and to correct the other person's false belief? Those are two great questions, but I think there's a second question that might be even more interesting. Of course, I'll say this because this is the thing that a philosopher would be interested in. And it's this question, how do we determine what those limits are? Specifically, what would justify us in allowing someone else to persist in having a false belief? And I think what makes this question especially good is that uh, the mysterious affairs at Stiles novel, novel give, us, give us some really good ideas. So what I'd like us to do is to examine these questions in reverse order and then hopefully come to a preliminary conclusion, which then we can discuss uh, a little more in Q&A. So what I'd like to start out by doing is to think about some reasons for allowing error. And these are moral reasons. When is it morally permissible for us to allow someone else to continue on in a false belief? Well, here's one, and we'll call it non-interference. Now, I wanna be clear about this reasoning. When I say that the reason I didn't get involved is because I didn't want to interfere, sometimes I'm not using this as a mo moral reason, but instead an excuse, right? It's a smokescreen because I don't want to have to address something that I probably shouldn't address because it's inconvenient to me. So we don't want to think about that case. Instead, we want to think about the case where non-interference is a good moral reason. And when that happens, that probably involves a recognition that the matter at hand is not my business. Uh, what I judge about the situation is that the individual or the individuals that are uh, involved in the situation who hold the false belief are reasonably competent on these matters and really should be left alone to find out for themselves. And when I do this, if I'm doing this appropriately, Hopefully what I'm doing is showing a kind of respect for them. I respect their abilities to make decisions for themselves. After all, they're not children, they're adults. And we do see this in the novel. I mean, consider Poirot. He has amazing insight into a lot of things, but one of them is early on, he identifies that Lawrence Cavendish and Cynthia Murdoch misunderstand one another. Lawrence believes that Cynthia doesn't like him, and Cynthia thinks that Lawrence positively hates him. But Perot realizes that this is not a matter that I should interfere with. You know, these are very personal feelings. And so unless someone comes to me, preferably Lawrence or Cynthia, I won't get involved. And we can contrast that with Hastings because Hastings does get involved and he corrects Cynthia's belief, or at least tries to do so, to say that Lawrence, in fact, doesn't hate her. But the only reason he seems to do so is that Cynthia shares her confidence, right? She brings him into the discussion and invites him to provide feedback. So I think what that shows is that there are several situations where we can be morally justified in allowing others to persist in their error. But that's not the only case. Let's think of the second one. In a funny way, sometimes allowing other people to believe things that are false prevents harm, or in a worst case scenario, further harm. Now, what we have to do in this case is to judge truthfully that if we were to intervene in the situation, we would do something that could produce a bad consequence, which would be harmful. Now, there are a lot of different varieties of cases where this reason might apply. 
if we're in a mystery novel, perhaps there's this malevolent actor who's about to do something terrible, but they don't do it because they have some kind of false belief. Yet some other character in the novel has the true belief that if given to the malevolent actor will then result in something horrible. Well, clearly in that case, the other character should withhold right, the information they have to try to constrain the malevolent actor's behavior. But maybe a more common case is where we run into someone who may be in a compromised mental state. Maybe they're sleep deprived uh, in a serious way or, or they're drunk or, or, or just they're irrational. They're full of you know, terrible worry. Um, and they're about to do something that could, could hurt them if they were to know the truth about a matter. In that case, if we had the truth, we might not want to share that with them. We might want them to persist, at least in the moment, in having the false belief that keeps them from harm. And I can keep going on with other examples, but we have other things to talk about, like reason number three. Reason number three is the flip side. So there are better cases where we would say that rather than trying to produce a circumstance where we prevent a harm, we instead try to promote a good. And so we might judge that, you know, if I allow this person to continue to believe something false, something good will come about that. And I think here, this is probably one of the most uh, ordinary kind of case to, cases. So in the novel, Perot, in many situations, will allow Hastings to persist in some false belief. And many times it's about a clue about whether that clue is relevant or not to putting all the pieces together to find out who did it. Now, Perot may be justified in this if he believes that by not correcting Hastings' mistakes, Hastings will learn from them and perhaps become a better detective or at least a better reasoner. And if so, that seems to be very similar to what people do as parents or as teachers, right? Because they recognize that, you know, the best way for this child to learn is for them to persist in this mistake. So I won't correct them. I'll let them figure that out for themselves. Now, hopefully we're doing that with full knowledge of the situation and the recognition that this indeed will promote someone's good. So these are some important reasons that we might want to allow error. However, let me add one caveat. With reason two and reason three, we wanna be careful about not being too short-sighted about preventing harm or preventing good. Here's what I mean. Uh, maybe when you were a young child or maybe you know someone who is a young child that you had responsibility for, there was that, that terrible moment in their life where they had to go get the booster shot. And the booster shot itself was bad enough, but the anxiety beforehand was probably worse. Now, if you're a parent, you might be tempted to say, look, you know what? I think I'd just rather avoid the pain and suffering that's involved in the booster shot and defer things. Or maybe, you know, we'll just take our chances. Maybe they won't develop, you know, you know any of the, the diseases that they're supposed to be protected from. So in that case, what we're doing is we would be share, uh, trading a short-term harm but for one that's going to either reoccur down the road or be even worse. So what I would like to do for reason two and reason three is to make sure that we add an important qualification. So if we're preventing harm or promoting good by not getting involved in a situation to correct someone's belief, we've also judged that on balance, allowing someone to believe something false either prevents more harm or produces more good then could be achieved you know, in the long run if one corrected that false belief or then if one corrected that false belief. Okay, so this gives us what I think are three fairly common reasons to allow people to engage or continue to persist in erroneous belief that provide us with moral justification for do, doing so. However, as we notice, there are limits. There are some cases where we also have moral reasons, I think, to intervene and correct a mistake. So let's take a look at those. Now, at least two of them are in common with what we've already seen, because I think we could also say that a good reason to intervene in the case to correct someone's error is because if we don't, uh, then some harm is going to accrue from that mistaken belief. And so we should try to prevent it or alternatively to promote some kind of good. 
But if that's my reason for intervening, note that my interest here is not any kind of special duty to what's true or to the autonomy of some other individual, like we saw in the non-interference idea. Instead, my interest really is in the outcomes of this specific action that I'm about to undertake. So what I'm doing is I'm just looking at the specific circumstance that I'm in and the circumstance that the other individual is in. And then I'm asking myself, if I intervene now, would that prevent harm or not? The answer I get to that question may not be the same answer I would give in a future case that may involve many of the same factors. And that's because the outcomes are going to shift depending on which circumstance we're in. As opposed to if I have a general duty to tell the truth all the time, I know that regardless of what the circumstance is, I've just got to tell the truth. Now that could be a strength of these two reasonings or two reasons, or it could be a weakness. Um, but I want to keep that in mind and, and we'll return to these reasons later and apply them to a couple cases. Now, some people will say that a good reason to intervene and correct error is that generally we have a duty to correct falsehoods. Now, that might sound like a, a fairly uh, bold claim, but actually, if you look at uh, a lot of writers from early periods in human civilization, both philosophers and, and from religions, there is a lot of commonality when it comes to this particular point. And so I'm going to cherry pick one text. So if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, John famously reports that the truth will set you free. Um, you've probably encountered this uh, sentence many times in your life. It's just in some cases it may have been in Latin as the motto of some school, right? Because I think what we note out of this quotation is something that's a very, very powerful statement. It's this idea that truth has a kind of liberating power, whereas falsity has a kind of imprisoning power. Think about the power of propaganda. What gives part of its power? Well, part of its power is that we control others by telling them things that are not true. But rather than getting into the political context, let's shift back to discussing the novel. Consider the characters and styles. They engage in lots of different kinds of deceptions. But regardless of what the deception is, it appears that these deceptions not only produce misunderstandings that throw us, the reader, off, but cause individuals to misunderstand one another to the point, in some cases, of undermining relationships. We'll talk about John and Mary Cavendish in a moment. And then ultimately, it's deception that even makes murder possible. Were there no deception, the criminals couldn't perpetrate the crime. So I think what we recognize that what underlies the duty to correct falsehoods is a recognition that truth has a kind of goodness that's associated with it and falsity does not. One last reason, and then I think we'll be in a position to make some judgments about what we should do when it comes to other people and the false beliefs they have. So reason four is that there are contexts where by intervening and correcting error, we can either secure justice or prevent injustice. Now, initially we might think that justice and injustice is tied up in you know, goodness and harm or correcting falsehood and promoting truth. But I wanna suggest that actually it's a little different. Certainly these values do overlap but I think we can see how reason four is different by examining what justice is. Now, in the sense that I'll refer to justice, what I think about is treating people how they deserve, whereas injustice is treating people in the ways that they don't deserve. And I think a good way of handling that definition is thinking back to elementary school. So when we think back to elementary school, there were moments where people were rewarded for behavior. There were other times people were punished for behavior. And putting aside the means of reward and the means of punishment for a moment, let's assume that these are, are appropriate punishments and appropriate uh, rewards. I think we could agree that it would bother us if someone in the classroom was lifted up for being a good citizen when in fact everyone in the class knows that they're not. 
that would seem to be unfitting, that there'd be a misalignment. And that triggers us to feel that this is something that's just not fair. And so I think what underlies the idea of justice is this idea of fairness. And with injustice, it's this idea of unfairness. So to show how reason four is different from these other reasons, consider that justice doesn't always promote good or prevent harm. We know of cases probably in our criminal justice system where someone has been rightfully convicted of a crime and sentenced. And it's really made for great hardship for them and their family. And we recognize that, you know, if we could go back and alter things, we would. But right, even if we give a minimal penalty, well, what would a case be? Imagine an otherwise good person murdering someone else. Let's assume that that someone else, you know, wasn't well liked. Assume that the otherwise good person maybe did this, you know, uh, maybe they're under the influence of something or just, just completely broke down. You know, we could imagine that if we sentence them for that crime and send them to prison for a small term, that's going to cause quite a bit of hardship for them and anyone who depends upon them. And on balance, we might say that creates more harm than good, yet it would seem that justice would require that. If that's true, then that gives us a reason to think that, well, maybe justice is somehow different than promoting good or preventing harm. Okay, if these are things that you would like to pursue further in our Q&A, we will certainly do that. But I think now is the time for us to try to apply these reasons to a case so that we can get some more insight into what our duties might be. So here's the question. When is it permissible to allow error? And what I'd like us to do is to take the case of John Cavendish. So if you read, have read the novel, you know, late in the novel, something fairly startling happens. John Cavendish is arrested for the crime of murdering his stepmother. Now, what's not clear to any of us until later in the book is that Poirot is aware of the innocence of John Cavendish, yet he allows him to suffer through a criminal trial. Now, on the face of things, that appears to be extremely problematic. And I think we could agree that if what I'm calling here on your slide as point one, if that were an adequate and complete description of Poirot's behavior, he would obviously do wrong. And I think we can show why that is by going back to the justifications that we provided before. The justifications which would allow us to withhold information. Now imagine Perot trying the non-interference reason uh, to justify his decision. I think we would recognize that that would be fairly absurd. So on that account, Perot would be saying that, you know, it's okay for me to not say anything about John Cavendish's inner, uh, innocence because, you know, that's not my business. Well, John Cavendish, I think, would want it to be Poirot's business, right? He would welcome this intervention. And so I think were someone to use the idea of non-interference, it would be inappropriate in this context. And I think we could all easily admit that at least given our description of the situation, Poirot is not preventing any harm or producing good by keeping quiet. But of course, those of you who have read the novel know that this is not a complete description of the case. So what we need to do is we need to think about what else is relevant in Poirot's decision. Well, here's some other factors to consider. So we've said that Poirot is aware of the innocence of John Cavendish, yet allows him to suffer through a criminal trial. But here's what else we learn. Perot is ready to present evidence that will acquit John Cavendish if it appears that he is at risk of being found guilty. And that, at least in, on first glance, might tell us, okay, well, John Cavendish is in safe hands. He's not going to you know, be found guilty. 
But if this were Poirot's only moral reason, I think it would be gravely inadequate because think about what A is saying. A is saying that, you know, it's okay to just let someone suffer through a criminal trial, you know, just as long as you're willing to step in at the last minute and say, hey guys, he's not guilty. I mean, that would seem to make the person appear to be a kind of sadist or at least someone who's just very willing to cause unnecessary suffering without having a good reason. So if we used A alone to try to justify Perot's decision, this just would not fly. Now, of course, Perot is more sophisticated a reasoner than this. So let's add a second consideration. The consideration that perhaps Perot is using the trial to buy some time in finding missing evidence sufficient to prosecute the actual criminals. So those who may have not have read this novel, uh, we reach a point in the case where Perot is frustrated because he knows who has murdered Emily Inglethorpe, but he has a missing link that's out there that he needs to have that would be sufficient to bring the actual criminal or criminals to trial. But because of his fear that perhaps the criminal will catch on to what he's up to, maybe he uses the trial to buy himself some time so that justice eventually can be done. Oh, sorry. Now, even if we note that, what we would have to say is that if A and B are the reasons for going through the trial, we would need to balance the suffering that John Cavendish undergoes against the likelihood that the stalling action will work. And if we read carefully, Perot admits at the end of the book that the probability that the stalling tactic would work was not enough to sway him to allow Cavendish to go through the trial. He wasn't confident that this tactic would work at all. So what that indicates is there is actually something else that's driving him to allow Cavendish to go through the trial. And it's a bit surprising, especially to those of you who have not read the book. Perot uses the trial to reconcile two spouses, John and Mary Cavendish. Mary Cavendish reveals to one of the characters in the novel, Hastings, the, uh, the, the confidant of Perot, that she's about to leave John, that she's frustrated. It's time for her to, to move on. And Perot thinks that if I have John go through this criminal trial, then I can ensure that John and Mary get back together. And in fact, that's what happens. Now, given this justification, it seems clear that the reasoning that Poirot is using is the kind that appeals to good outcomes. He thinks that the trial will produce some good. And so his decision to allow the jurors, at least up to a point, the lawyers and all those who are involved in the trial to persist in a mistake is based on the fact that he thinks that the mistake in reasoning that they all uh, are undergoing will produce some greater benefit. So on balance, the good created by the trial outweighs any suffering that John undergoes. But is Perot justified? Is this a good reason to have John undergo this criminal trial? Now, I think we can say this. Perot's reasoning here is first, that it's morally permissible to allow John to suffer through a trial, despite the fact that he possesses evidence that would avoid a trial because the trial would reconcile John and his wife, Mary. Okay. And if he's justified in that reasoning, it also appears that he's forced to accept some other conclusions. Well, what would one of those conclusions be? Well, one is very simple, that he wouldn't just do this in the case of John and Mary, but through any other couple that's about to split, right? So it would seem to be that one principle that Poirot is committed to affirming is that, well, anytime you or I foresee that a criminal trial will reconcile spouses, one of whom is the innocent defendant without risk that the defendant will be found guilty, then one should not come forward with evidence that would honor, exonerate the defendant. Now that might seem absurd in one 
and on, on one hand, but in Perot's defense, let's be honest, how often is that really gonna happen? I mean, I can't imagine a criminal trial proceeding that way where, where we have this, this confluence of circumstances. So maybe this is really not anything to worry about. However, I think there is a second consequence that we need to be aware of. And it comes from a principle in law and philosophy or in ethics specifically of treating like cases like. So we shouldn't just focus on the good of spousal reconciliation, but I think we also need to extend this to anything that would create a similar weighty good. So what I would like to say is, is that Pro is also committed to saying that anytime you or I foresee that a criminal trial will produce a good that's similar in weight to spousal reconciliation, where again, the defendant similarly stands to benefit and where there's no risk that the defendant will be found guilty, then you shouldn't come forward with evidence that will exonerate the defendant. Just let the trial happen so that good will accrue. Now, if we accept these points, I think what we're willing to do is to say that the goal of a criminal trial in these cases is not really to mete out justice, but rather to produce good outcomes. And consider why that is, at least in the case of John Cavendish, this trial is completely unnecessary from the standpoint of justice because Perot has it in his power to prevent the trial from ever happening. He can exonerate him on the spot. And what I wanna suggest, at least for sake of argument, is that this appears to be a misuse of the criminal justice system. It provides us with some reason to think that Perot did the wrong thing in the sense of doing something morally wrong. And what I think the problem is, is that he's subordinating the value of justice, which should be a fundamental value to a good result that would otherwise not have result. Now in Perot's terms, he says that he values the happiness of quote, one man and one woman over all other things. We can call that love for, you know, uh, for brevity's sake. But if we're preferring that to all other things, that would include justice. And I think his decision helps illustrate that. And I think as the picture notes, this defense is a, like a house of cards. There are several problems here in proceeding with this route. Now the description to withhold evidence, remember, was based on producing goods, specifically securing love between two people. But I don't think that's a good guideline, at least from a moral standpoint. And the way I want to show that it's not a good guideline is by looking back again at Lawrence Cavendish. So you might recall that Lawrence Cavendish is uh, in love, for lack of a better word, with uh, Cynthia Murdoch. But what's unusual about this love manifests itself in Lawrence's behavior following the death of his stepmother. Lawrence begins acting in very odd ways. One way is to try to persist in saying that his stepmother died of natural causes when it seems fairly apparent that she died from poisoning. And later on, we learn, in fact, Lawrence knows what he's doing. He's doing this on purpose. So he's trying to deceive investigators to close the case, to rule the death as natural causes, and then allow the murderer or murderers to get away with the crime. Now, why would Lawrence do that? Well, Lawrence's thinking is that the person he's in love with, Cynthia Murdoch, may have murdered his stepmother and he wants to protect her and perhaps then be able to pursue the relationship that he desires. Now that might be reading a little more into the novel than that's there, but clearly he wants to protect her. But what we're seeing again is that Cavendish, like we saw with Perot, is subordinating other values for love. And in this case, it's justice. But if Lawrence does wrong in this particular case, which I think we can all agree he does wrong, by analogy, Perot's decision is wrong as well. 
Now we won't talk about degrees of wrongness. Maybe what Lawrence did was a lot wronger, if that would, was ever a word that's completely not the right word. I'm sorry to all my English colleagues, uh, but occasionally we have to have a little entertainment with uh, poor grammar. But there are degrees of wrongness perhaps that, that are involved, but my point is, is I'm not so interested in whether something is substantially wrong or marginally wrong, whether I'm interested in the fact that it's still wrong. Perot shouldn't have done it, though maybe he doesn't do as badly as Cavendish does. However, let's remind ourselves that Perot is a fairly ingenious person, and he also seems to be a person of good moral character. So maybe we're missing something. So what I would like us to try to do is to see if there are any lines of defense that we can marshal to show that in fact, Perot did something that was morally permissible. So here's one attempt. One attempt would be to say is, well, in both cases, both are trying to secure an outcome. Lawrence is trying to secure an outcome that's favorable for him and Cynthia, particularly a loving relationship. Perot is trying to also secure a loving relationship, but in this case, between John and Mary. Now, when we look at the prospects for love, Lawrence and Cynthia are already off to really bad footing. They don't think either likes one another. And compound that with the fact that Cynthia may be a murderer and that Lawrence is willing to cover up, it just kind of looks like a train wreck. Whereas at least with John and Mary, they put up with each other for several years. And now it looks like that they've been united through the trial. So at least from the standpoint of good outcomes, we might say that Perot was justified because he could actually get those good outcomes, but Lawrence has no hope. However, if you're a good outcomes person, I don't think that this is going to work. And it's for an observation that Perot notes. Perot says that the reason that he felt the trial was necessary is that because both John and Mary are very prideful people. And it's only through something shocking like a trial that they could overcome their pride to find true love. To me, that seems a little bit like a Band-Aid, right? A, a pretty good Band-Aid, but one that's going to have a, a short lifespan. For unless they deal with their pride five, 10, 15 years down the road, they're probably gonna be in the same situation again with them frustrated with one another with the relationship dissolved. So I don't think Perot can be so, he, can, he can't be so confident that the outcomes are going to work out the way that he thinks they will. Now you might argue, but well, wait, it's Perot. He's always right, but, but that's just not the world that we live in. So I'm going to put that defense aside and think of what might be a better defense. Well, what about this? We know that Lawrence deceives and Perot deceives in a way, but they're different in the kind of deception. Lawrence is actively deceiving others to secure love. So what he's trying to do is to implant false beliefs in other people in order to get what he wants. Whereas Pro doesn't do this. I mean, people already believe things that are false. He's just letting him do that. And so we do see that there is an important difference in the type of act that Lawrence undertakes versus the type of act that Perot does. Lawrence is actively deceiving. Pro is not actively deceiving. But I'm not impressed with this defense either, because I think in both cases, we can characterize what the two are doing the same way. Both are engaging in willful deception. And the worry that we have is that if this deception is left unchecked, others will likely make wrong decisions, believe falsehoods, do things that are, are not good. So again, I don't think that this is the distinction with much of a difference. I just think it's a, a smoke screen. However, if, if we want to talk about defense two a little more in Q&A, we can do so. I'd like to proceed though to some of the better defenses. So let's look at defense three. I think defense three has something that might be going for it. And Lawrence's attempt to secure love requires in his mind that the deception be successful thereby perpetuating an injustice. So he knows that in order to gain what he wants, he has to do something that is clearly unjust. When Perot attempts to secure love through deceptive means, 
that love or that means is checked by his unwillingness to let John be found guilty. So Perot is unwilling to allow an injustice to occur while Lawrence is actually promoting an injustice. And that seems to be a fairly large difference. Okay, but as you might guess, I'm not impressed with that either. Because it has this appearance in this defense of saying that these are two different kinds of ways of handling justice. And I don't think that's true at all. I think the difference between Perot and Lawrence is one of degree. Perot and Lawrence are both fine with injustice. It's just that their difference is the amount of injustice that they're willing to tolerate. Lawrence has no problem with allowing lots of injustice, whereas Perot is willing to tolerate some injustice. He's a willing to allow this sham of a trial to go through, to prosecute someone who doesn't deserve it in order to, well, do what? Perhaps get some other outcome. But really justice is not in the forefront of his mind and it's not the value that's dictating his decision. So I don't think that defense three has much going for it at least on the standpoint of justice. So let's make one last ditch effort, which requires a little change with the novel. Let's suppose that Perot sees the trial as the only way to convict uh, two individuals. We won't say any more about those, um, but maybe these people are individuals of interest. Now, if these were the actual criminals, then the stall tactic would appear to be a case of Perot trying to bring justice, right? To try to actually use John to stall to get to the point where we have enough evidence to convict the actual criminals. So in that case, couldn't Perot defend his position on the grounds of justice? Well, I'm gonna be a broken record here and I'm gonna say no, because remember justice is not a matter of producing the best outcome, but treating people how they deserve. I mean, at pain of redundancy, I think we have to remind ourselves that putting John on trial for a crime Perot knows he didn't commit, doesn't treat him as he deserves. No one should be prosecuted for a crime we know they didn't commit. And so we can't make a later trial just or a current trial just, even though it might secure the evidence to get the correct criminal later on. So I'm at the point where I think we need to admit that Pro has done something wrong in the novel. But what does that mean for us? And I, mean, I think this is the whole point of the talk tonight. What should we conclude? I wanna conclude with three things. The first is, if we believe that justice outweighs good outcomes, which for the sake of this presentation, I want to suggest we should consider, at least for the next 20 minutes, then Perot and other people in styles do wrong by allowing others to believe falsehoods. But if we're going to say that, notice there comes with what could be a pretty terrible cost. That may mean that some people are not convicted for crimes they committed, as in the murder of Emily Inglethorpe. So if we go back to our supposition, if the only way to find the rightful killers of Emily Inglethorpe is to go through with the sham trial of John Cavendish, then if we're going to insist on justice, we may have to let murderers go free. And for some people, that's too big of a consequence to swallow. Now, for most of us, thankfully, justice is not what's at stake when we look at someone else who has a false belief and decide whether or not we want to intervene. And so the good news for us is that we can consider these other reasons that could potentially justify us in allowing them to believe falsehoods, like this idea of non-interference. Look, they're old enough to make their own decisions and there's not so much harm or harm associated with believing that, that, you know, I shouldn't intervene. Or, or maybe there is harm in, involved and look, it's just not my business. And of course, the other two reasons were, I'm just not gonna say anything because that'll prevent harm or promote good. But the one last thing I wanna leave you with is that 
I think we can probably admit that for each one of us, we would prefer not to believe things that are false. But if that's so, then I think other things being equal, we would appear to have a duty to correct mistaken beliefs. Now we want to underline that word, other things being equal, because this is not a recommendation to now go forth and correct all of the false beliefs that you can see. Now we'll balance that with the other values, but if no other value is in play, then it seems our duty is to correct that mistaken belief. And so I think we should have some sympathy for the character Hastings, right? In many cases, right, he's going through these driving through these blind alleys that Perot could easily steer him away from, right, and get back onto the right track. So Hastings could have some reason to complain that Perot was not more forthcoming with some of his evidence. But let's all be honest, as readers, we can be glad for Perot's reticence. It would make for a, a pretty sad novel, I think, to find that you and I now have all the information in chapter two. So what I would like to do at this point is to get your thoughts about these reasons or perhaps what you think Perot is up to, um, but I'll, I'll turn things over to, to you or maybe to Jen to moderate and I'll be glad to, to try to answer the questions you have. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And I will go ahead and open it up to questions because of the, the wonderful size of our meeting. Uh, there's no way for me to actually call on you. So um, just go ahead and unmute if you have a question and we'll we'll do our best to take turns. So doctor, do you believe that uh, there's an air of virtue that's written into Perot's character at all? Uh... So, so that I can make sure I answer that question correctly. Do I think that maybe he has some kind of character flaw? Is that right? Right. So he's, he's actually following this, the, the middle ground, right? He's, he's not, uh, um, you know, he's not following uh, either going left or going right. And, and he, instead he's letting things kind of play out himself staying true to his craft uh, or his, his expertise and letting things kind of just unfold on their own. And along the way, kind of picking the best, uh, you know, the b best points to focus on for the greater good and whatnot. But uh, it almost sounds like there's a little bit of virtue that's written into his character intentionally. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think uh, what I focused on was an outlier, right? So when we look at his reaction to John Cavendish, it seems that this is out of character for Perot, at least in this novel. Um, because as you point out, he, and he's very methodical, right? He's not willing to rush things. I mean, he's very, very careful through the investigation to make sure that he has enough evidence before he brings forward the conviction. And so I think you're right that he's not somebody who's got the agenda where he's trying to force things. You know, when when he admits what he's done, it seems like this was a spontaneous spur of the moment thing that, you know, he justifies, like there's this feeling that overcame me and I just, I just felt I had to do that, which I think probably was the error of judgment. But I don't think that's reflective of his character. So I think you would be right to say that overall Perot gives us a nice model of a virtuous person. Um, so I wanted to thank you for your comments. It's very interesting to hear this structured around um, the concept of justice, because I think we can safely say there are not many characters who seem to value justice. The involvement of Perot from the beginning has little to do with getting justice and more to do with uh, avoiding embarrassment. And we've had a number of writing prompts where we find um, points and discussions where it's clear everyone is more concerned with the social implications or the relationship implications of what's going on than actually finding the murderer here. 
Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, and it would seem like for the person who truly values relationship uh, and, and even, you know, what the appropriate basis for a good reputation would be would also be the person who, like Perot, acts virtuously and is willing to maybe endure some hardship, right? Knowing that one will come out on the other side. So I think uh, that's a very astute comment to, to show, you know, where most of these characters are and where we can sympathize with, um, uh, I'm forgetting her name, the last name Howard, right? Uh, Evelyn. It's going to call her Ev Emily. Evelyn Howard does at least have some very good insight where she, of all people, notes that this is a scurrilous bunch of people, right? Their motivations just aren't really where they ought to be. And for those of you who are introverts, we do have a chat feature that you're welcome to you know, post a question there and I'll make sure I keep my eyes in the chat. I'm an introvert usually, so I'm usually not the one speaking up during Zoom sessions, uh, at least for, for presentations. My colleagues might be, well, you sure talk a lot in meetings. Well, that would be the exception, but not academic things. Yes, Alan makes a very good point, right? Well, the thing about uh, Evelyn is that she's very astute because she's planning on doing something and she's taking advantage of the situation. So though she is a good judge of the character of others, the irony is, is that her own character is problematic. Yeah. So it's maybe not so prevalent in this book where we have a bunch of English um, English men and women, but um, you had put up in one of your earlier slides um, some of the um, reasons that you you may or may not interfere about things not being my business or um, securing justice or having a duty to tell the truth, and it. it it struck me briefly um, about how those lines can be very blurred when um, considering where you come from um, around the world, especially that concept of not my business, because um, even, even across different communities in the United States, there are some people who think everything's their business. And there are some people that if you even ask them how they're doing, they, you get, they get very offended at you um because <laughs> that's none of your business who are you to ask me um and so it I, I wonder how how one really takes these um evaluations to that higher level when you have all those factors coming in in maybe a mixed group setting of trying to determine you know are we on a moral path or not yeah that's a that's an excellent question um i think the way that some philosophers in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century operated was to think that there were certain general principles that we could use to apply to cases uh, to, to generate the right results. And I, I'm not here to say that there aren't ways that you can do that, but I tend to prefer some of the more ancient views that come out of Greek or, or Chinese. Or uh, it, It's really interesting when you look at the Eastern and Western worlds that a lot of the early ethical writings were very much based on looking at specific situations, developing competencies to be able to observe. Um, and that kind of moral observation requires an accumulation of a lot of experience. I think the underlying idea is that moral situations often are unique in many ways and involve a lot of complexity. And so it's really difficult for us to be able to transfer, at least early on in our lives, um, the lessons that we've learned from our experiences and to take them into new contexts. So I think what we would have to probably do and, and what you're suggesting is oftentimes, you know, err on the side of non-interference, especially when we're in those cases where we're not culturally competent because we're not in a position to be able to identify 
you know, what are the values really here at stake? You know, I may think I know what they are, but I project some things onto a case that really aren't there. And so um, I think going back to, um, I think it was uh, Eric's point earlier, a uh, Perot gives us a nice model, you know, from the criminal investigation side of things is that sometimes you just have to let that information come in and be quiet. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, and what you're pointing out, uh, Abigail, is that this principle of non-interference often is one we'll just have to, you know, if, if we're not in a position of authority, uh, like, like you might be here at the university where it's like, look, okay, right now I'm not in that role, you know, I'm in this other role, um, we might just have to let that play out until we develop those competencies. And even when we develop the competencies, we might realize it's a good thing that I stayed out because right? it is not my business. I'm trying so hard to wait in case other people have questions, but that's such a perfect segue to my question, Jonathan. Um, you mentioned roles, right? And just this past week in the class, we were talking about the prosecution and the defense and the cases they mount uh, in, in trying to convict John Cavendish and then trying to exonerate him solely by proving that other people might be responsible. And so I'm wondering um, if Poirot's role as the private investigator, right, as the detective who's been brought in um, to help out the Stiles family, does that have any bearing on what his duty is in this situation, right? Is he constrained to his position? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, because um, my own answer is, is that at least initially, he owes something, he has a special duty to the family. Uh, but I think that that special duty evaporates once certain uh, values are at stake. So um, I mean, if, if the value in this case is justice, then even though I might have been brought into the investigation, I do need to proceed. And, 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 and if it doesn't look good for the family, I still have to go ahead, though I might exercise caution and use a lot more sensitivity in making those facts known. And I think that's similar to some of the roles that each of us may play where, you know, we recognize that, you know, I have a special relationship with someone or, you know, I've been asked to do something for someone, but, but there are those limits where we have to say, well, I can't do that because, you know, that would compromise a, a value that we should all share. looks like we have another comment in chat. So let me make sure I process that first. So there was a further discussion about the character of Evelyn Howard and how, um, uh, you know, Christie writes her in such a way that she is a character that you immediately get attached to. And I agree, right? Uh, as you point out, she seems, you know, she's the one who tells us don't trust anyone, right? And, and, and she's right about that in the early novel, but then she's right in the end as well. And I, I think that that's a, that's a great point. And, and that shows too something interesting about how um, Christy, portrays the criminal mind as having this kind of ability to, you know, not only cover its own tracks, but to deal, to be able to tell enough truth, right, for us to be able to take the individual seriously and to take them off the list of suspects, right? And as you point out, Alan, right, you know, she is, and it's funny when she tells us, you know, don't trust anyone. This is true about everyone, including herself. That's right. That's right.
maybe I can ask the uh, the audience a question. And if you want to put this in chat, that might be a good thing for you. When you think about uh, you know the moral reasons that you feel are are the ones that are most important to you. What goes at the top of your list? I'm not saying what should be at the top of your list, but what tends to go at the top of your list? And of course, we've got to think about, first of all, am I the person who has no problem of intervening and telling people that what they believe is wrong? I think I have some relatives on this, this call and they say, oh yeah, you have no problem telling us that you're wrong, right? But what's my motivation, right? It, it needs to be a moral motivation, right? So, so we won't say what was my motivation, which might have been, you know, I want to make myself look better than someone else. But what, what would the moral motivation really be? I mean, if, if I'm doing this out of a concern for doing the right thing, what would that be? Some of us are more likely to find ourselves in situations where maybe morally we find out that we're not intervening. And here's our reason. Well, it was, you know, this non-interference thing or, you know, it was the preventing harm. Any any thoughts about for you, um, what comes to mind as you process these these kinds of situations? Jonathan, could you give us some examples of moral motivation? Right, like so is, is justice is do no harm is yeah good. What are what would be some examples? I think you got them all right there. Right, so right, so in the case of. Uh, what that duty of non-interference, right? I trust the competency of others to make decisions for themselves. I want to, you know, prevent harm by getting involved or not getting involved to promote good or justice would be the other, other case. Or, or maybe you're the person who just feels like you have a duty to correct falsehood and make sure that truth is promoted. I know there's some truthers out there, right? You're like, oh, you know, it bothers me when thing, people say things that are false. There are no English professors or philosophy professors or other professors or other people here like that. Librarians, right? There's a lot of us who, yep, yep, Abigail. Well, it's good because you're a gatekeeper in your role. So I'm very glad that you're a truther. Uh, if, you're, if you're an accountant, if you're a lawyer, uh, you know, any of those gatekeeping roles, thank goodness, yes. Yes, Dr. Martin, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's so nice to hear that truth is important, right? Melanie Sam's great. And that's okay. Sometimes people are like, well, you know, I'm more of the good person, or I'm more of a person who's like, let's let's allow people to make decisions for themselves. I mean, I think I'm kind of a hybrid. I mean, I like to think of myself as a truther and a justicer, but sometimes I'm the, the non-interference. Yeah, yeah, Eric, yeah, thank you. Cure over justice, to be honest, right? I mean, there is important value to, to mercy, right? Justice isn't the be all and end all of everything. Sometimes it's important to recognize. I mean, I think those of you who deal with others, uh, whether they're children, students, friends, spouses, you know, People make mistakes and maybe we recognize the mistake, but then we offer forgiveness or we offer if we, you know, think that that's appropriate. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Carol. I mean, as a nurse, thank you for being honest. That's hard, right? Right, to, to tell people things that, you know, they don't wanna hear. I mean, I, th I would especially think that that's true right now, right? There's a lot of things that, that people don't wanna hear. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah, and, and and being a truther does take a lot of courage and confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wendy, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, are there other thoughts or other questions that you have? Yeah, and Miguel makes a good point. I mean, uh, truth is is a basis, right, for for communication, right? It's a it it actually is the open, honest way of, of, you know, inviting other people in to say that, look, you know, I'm someone to be trusted, right? And I can, you know, hopefully that's also, you know, moderated with, with other things. But if we don't have truth, then it's hard to build any kind of relationship. Absolutely.
still thinking about the attorneys in the trial. There are a lot of lawyers in my family, which might be why. But uh, you know, they're in a in a unique position where their their function, right, their responsibility, is to um, not necessarily correct falsehoods, right? If they're acting in the best interest of their clients, and so I'm, I don't know. I'm I'm just kind of curious, Jonathan, about your thoughts about the way the court system is set up to create this this maybe artificial role where, where people wouldn't act as private citizens should act. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's difficult. And I think it's best to think about in the case of the criminal trials, right? Because that's where the stakes are really high. Um, and those are examples in the book, right? We have uh, yeah. execution and then Sir, the, the wonderfully named Sir Ernest Heavyweather. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think ultimately the goal of the trial, right, is to come up with the correct verdict. Uh, but the question is, is, you know, what is the, it's a matter of method, right, as, as Perot would say. And we have to recognize that uh, in, in jury trials, uh, one of the things that has to be done is to ensure that, you know, we're removing people's biases and unconscious biases to get uh, what we would consider to be the best defense for each side. Now I think there are limits to the defense, right? Right, bringing forward you know spurious allegations to get your client off the hook, like, like as we see in a lot of you know, uh, Netflix and other dramas, to say, okay, it could be this other person. I want to ca cast doubt on this other person without really having, you know, evidence. Seems to me to be something that that that's quite problematic, and I think goes beyond um, what the lawyers. Uh, ethical duties are. I mean, what they should do is to say that if I'm casting reasonable doubt uh, by pointing to someone else, I should have evidence that is similar in kind to say, really, you know, this, this, is, this is someone that we need to consider. Otherwise, I think your tack is different, is to, to challenge the evidence, right? Not to point, well, this is the person who could have done it, but Let's talk about the quality of the case. Look, there are holes here. You know, the, the testimony that we've received, if this, if it's garbled, then I think it's fair to point that out to have the discussion to process it. So, so while there is this kind of confrontation, of course, that's necessary in the, the civil trial, um, and where the defense does have an obligation and a duty to, to bring the best case forward, I think there are those limits, right, where we can't take down other innocent parties in doing so. But then that doesn't entirely address the question of truth, probably, because um, I mean, what we would have to probably do is to look at specific kinds of cases. Um, but I think what I would like to suggest, if this were possible, and I'm not an experienced lawyer, so this might be impractical, um, but I think it's really important for, for lawyers to make claims that are, that are not deceptive, right? to try to not you know, uh, intentionally produce false beliefs in the minds of the jury. Rather, it's to, to honestly show where the problems or holes in a case are. And then if you can't do that, give that up, right? <laughs> and I, I see Wendy and others have put in some comments in the chat. And Wendy, I know I, I'm with you. It's hard to talk about court cases or truth without thinking of our current political climate. And, and I think we're all trying to skirt that uh, can of worms. I think, I think Wendy, uh, you're, you're right. I think um, it, this isn't a new issue though in politics. Uh, politics has always involved an element of, you know, people saying things that they know are false like giving, you know, I have a, a wonderful former colleague who now teaches at uh, a Southern Methodist University. And uh, she, she talks about, you know, uh, promises that you make that you don't intend to fulfill, right? This is one of the classes of things. And, and politicians do this on a regular basis, right? They give you these promises. And those of you who know the issues know that there's no way they're gonna fulfill these. I mean, it would require, you know, too many steps to, to take and, and the, without there being consensus or without there you know, being shifts in how economics work, uh, it's, it, it's not going to happen. Yet the politicians still go ahead because you know, it's, it's, it's popular. Um, of course, the political 
dialogue has gotten a lot worse than 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 what I'm speaking of right here. But 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 when you live in an environment where you feel like all you hear on television are people who are saying what maybe some people want to believe rather than what's true, it's it, it really undermines our ability to have civil and effective conversation. So I think, you know, Wendy, that's a very, very good point. Um, let me try to keep working through some of the other comments that you have there. Yeah, yeah, Eric, as you pointed out uh, and noting, you know, one of uh, Letitia's comments that truth requires vulnerability, it certainly does. Um, you do expose yourself to, you know, what you consider to be risk, um, whether it's loss of reputation uh, or more tangible uh, losses. And I think you're right. It's very, very clear in the novel, right? Uh, you know, Mary, John, you know, other people who are innocent parties, right, have things that they don't want to reveal because of, you know, you know being embarrassed. So uh, Wendy asks, you know, since Perot stated he was hired by John Cavendish, did he not have a duty to work for the defense? That's, that's a very good point, right? You would think that, in fact, there's, in addition to what I've discussed, and I missed this, so Wendy, I probably should have had you help me with this presentation. It looks there's an implicit promise that Perot is breaking in allowing John to see uh, a criminal trial to, to go through that process. Though I suppose one could argue that in the end, his goal is to try to, to find the, the actual killers. So what we would have to do is to talk about, you know, how do we understand the duties to the defense? Is it justice, treating people justly no matter what, or is it a particular outcome? So that's, that's a very, very good point. Lots of good points are coming up here. Um, so let me read Andrea's comment. Um, so one thing to consider is how you present the truth to others and how much you must present. And I think that's a really, really good point um, because this is a, a kind of situation that we deal with in, in, in life. People ask us an uncomfortable question. We might feel like, look, I owe them the truth, but I don't really wanna have to present all of it. And I think we recognize there are some cases where we have to bite the bullet and maybe present it all and others where it's entirely appropriate to say, well, no, I'm gonna withhold some. Uh, let me continue on with what Andrea has written. Um, so we see Perot present pieces of the truth throughout the book, such as exposing the alibi of Mr. Inglethorpe while the po poison was purchased or giving hints to Hastings without giving him it all at once. And I think what that suggests, and I think that that's a, a very nice comment, uh, what that suggests is, is there are ways in which one gives another person what they think is, excuse me, enough information for them to correct their own beliefs, but they just don't succeed in making that adjustment. If so, so Perot at the end says, well, look, uh, Hastings, I told you this, and I told you that, and I told you that. Didn't you understand what I was saying here? And, and of course, Hastings being Hastings doesn't get it. Well, I have to admit, I didn't either in many of those situations. Um, so from the standpoint of a person like Perot, if they're thinking they're giving pieces of the picture so that the other person can work it out for themselves, um, you are presenting the truth. You are presenting information that I think you might reasonably say could change the person's mind, even if in fact that doesn't happen, which interestingly goes back to the point of the current political climate. There are situations where we might have a discussion with someone else and you tell them something that you think will get them to change their mind, but it doesn't work have you satisfied that duty to try to change their mistaken belief? And I think the answer is, well, well, sure, right? You can't control the reactions of other people, but what you can do for yourself is to say, you know, what do I think a reasonable person would do if they were confronted with the evidence I have? If you think that a reasonable person would stop believing what it is that they're believing, You've done, it looks like what you need to do as far as our duties are concerned. 
and uh, you don't have to go the extra mile necessarily, right? Let me keep going. There's some other great questions here. Um, yeah, I think Mary Ann, you know, continues with Andrea's point, right? Debbie writes, looking at this work of fixture, Pro had to keep his evidence to himself in order to keep the plot moving. Yeah, it, it, it's easy for me to criticize when I don't have to write the novel, right? Right, and then I am definitely not gonna criticize Agatha Christie or, or most any, any novelist. I think even the novel, there's a few novels and I can tell you offline, there's one novel where at the end of the novel, I hated every single character, just hated them all. And then I realized, oh, maybe that's the point of the novel, right? And to feel bad for them, but also to hate each one of them. And it, and it, and it had all these layers that it started to, okay, the, the book was Train Spotting by Irving Welsh. Um, I don't recommend that anyone reads it unless they're forewarned about the content of the novel. I didn't really know what I was getting into. And there's a lot of Scottish brogue that you have to work through with. Um, but all the characters are selfish, petty, they do terrible things. Um, but you also understand their motivations there uh, as well. And so even there, I realized, you know what? Yeah, I don't like the characters, but that's okay. Why well, I shouldn't criticize the author. This is the author's book. It's clear that they're, that they're doing something here. And uh, in a mystery novel, you're gonna have to have your characters withhold evidence to make for a good story. Any final questions for Dr. Evans? Well, thank you, Jonathan. As always, you have me thinking about the book in a in a new way, which is a really impressive feat this close to the end of the semester. <laughs> um, and I, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, everyone else, I put up in the chat, you'll have to scroll up a while through our conversation, but I, I included a link uh, to the Community University website, which is where you will be able to view the recorded lectures. Um, we'll post tonight's lecture, hopefully later this week. Um, that's also where the book played and bookmark are. And for those of you interested in signing up for next fall, um, sometime this summer, the link for signing up for Moby Dick will be, will be posted there as well. So I hope I'll get to see you all again next fall. Um, thank you again to Dr. Evans for a wonderful talk. Thank you.